Let's talk about some of the fundamentals that make a democracy work and what democracy is and tie it in with personal development work that we're doing, with consciousness work, with spirituality, and also with the current events that are happening around me. I've, I've gotten multiple uh, comments and feedbacks over the last couple of months that I've seen in the comment sections where people want me to talk about COVID-19 or they want me to talk about the Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter protests and uh, other things that are happening in current events. So that's going to tie in with this discussion of democracy. So what is democracy? How do, we re how do we really understand what democracy is and how to make it work effectively? Where to even begin with this topic? Um, we're going to be kind of going all over the place. This is going to be a freewheeling discussion. I don't have anything planned per se. But uh, the first thing we should notice about democracy is how much it's taken for granted. Especially if you grew up in a democratic country, more or less, a developed country, first world country, where some degree of democracy is available, it's very easy to take it for granted and to not see the challenges, the inherent challenges that democracy brings. So fundamentally, what is democracy about? about? It's about giving ordinary people autonomy in controlling their futures, their lives, and the trajectory of their society. It's where ordinary people are involved in important decisions about war, about taxation, about regulation, about discrimination, about rights, about laws, and the direction of society, how to structure healthcare, how to structure the economy, and so on. And people, we just sort of assume that, well, democracy is just sort of like the default state, and it just works. Because if you're in a country like in America, then it's sort of been here for a couple hundred years, and people just take it for granted. But, and then also, you know, like when we look at other countries, less developed countries, third world countries from America or from Europe, we look at those countries like Iraq or perhaps China or perhaps other places in the Middle East or in South America or something like that, where there are dictatorships and autocrats and tyrants and uh, oligarchies and, and things of this nature. Uh, we tend to look at that and we say, oh, look how crude and how barbaric they are, how evil they are. And if we could just bring democracy to them the way we tried to do with Iraq. But then, of course, we see the problems and the limitations of, of what happens when you do try to bring democracy to the Middle East, to places like Iraq. It doesn't work. So why doesn't it work? And we also have negative stereotypes about what autocracy and tyranny is is sort of baked into our culture like oh well tyranny is wrong and evil and then we look at people like hitler or stalin or mao and others like that throughout history we look at them as emperors and tyrants and dictators and this is supposed to be like bad stuff but have you actually ever wondered about why autocracy is so prevalent throughout history, and still is even now in the 21st century. There are still many dictators and tyrants around the world in various countries. Why is that? If dictatorship and tyranny and authoritarianism is so bad, why is it so popular? I mean, wouldn't it be obvious that like people in Iraq would just automatically see Saddam Hussein as a bad person and overthrow him? Wouldn't that be the obvious thing that happens? Because obviously it's bad, so why do people put up with something that's obviously bad and wrong and unjust? We tend to have very simplistic notions of democracy. The first thing we need to understand about democracy is that it's not a binary. It's not like, oh, well, we have democracy or we don't. There are many, many degrees and orders of magnitude of democracy. 
And there's this sort of myth that we've developed, at least in, within American democracy, this, this notion of like, well, America was just founded on democratic principles. It was a democracy from the beginning. Now, of course, obviously people say, oh, Leo, but America's a, a republic, technically. Um, let's not split hairs about this sort of terminology. Uh, what's important is that one of the innovations of the American Constitution was the idea that uh, citizens get the right to vote. Now, of course, there were severe limitations on what counted as a citizen. You excluded females, you excluded blacks, you excluded uh, Native Americans and, and a bunch of other stuff. And you even, at the very beginning, you even excluded poor white people who didn't own land and didn't have any kind of status. So really, even though America was a democracy, we sort of say, you know, in the history class, we say that America was started as a democracy, but really, how democratic was it? The degree of democracy there was pretty limited. Looking back at it now, two and a, two and a half centuries later, we see so many people were disenfranchised, didn't have a lot of power. So there's sort of like the myth of democracy, the sort of idea that, oh, everybody in the country gets to decide the direction of the country. And then there's the sort of reality of it, of what who's really pulling the strings in terms of influencing the direction of the country. And the reality of it is that it's, it's a very select group of elite people who have status, power, certain position. Usually they're born into a certain class, even though they're not might be official classes, but basically the people who run the show are, are a pretty small segment of the population. The general population, even today in the 21st century, not to mention two and a half centuries ago, don't have much of a say at all in determining the direction of the country. Why is that? See, there are certain inherent limitations to democracy. And democracy only works effectively when it fits a certain psyche and a certain cognitive level of development, a certain moral level of development, and a certain educational level, and a certain level of consciousness within people. If we just take a group of chimpanzees and we try to give them democracy, it's not going to stick. Why not? Because they're operating at such a low level of cognitive and cognitive development, moral development, and level of consciousness that they're not going to be able to sustain that. Even if you were able to teach them, assume we can get over the language barriers and so forth, they wouldn't be able to sustain it. Because they're more animals. And as animals, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to sustain democracy within a society of animals. So you see, all if we go back thousands of years into the origins of human civilization, all of these civilizations thrived on strong leadership and basically tyranny and authoritarianism. Because survival was very brutal. Basic matters of just having a shelter, having a farm, raising your children, and making sure that that's secured and that you don't get attacked by marauders and warlords and enslaved, raped and pillaged, and have all your goods and, and work stolen, uh, just to ensure that that didn't happen required severe compromise on behalf of those farmers and workers. They were basically put into a, a very difficult situation where either they could act like libertarians and try to just maintain their autonomy and their freedom and not be subjugated by anybody. They could try to do it that way. But if they did, then they would quickly be just physically overrun by warlords and marauders because they didn't have the physical power. They didn't have the organizational structure to defend themselves. You know, a couple of farmers living in a, in a little village can't defend themselves against some marauders coming in from out of town who have 
thousands of, of troops and uh, elaborate weapons and horses and carriages and, and catapults and whatever else they've got. See, they, they, there's, there's nothing they're going to be able to do to prevent them from getting uh, just overpowered physically. So what they're sort of forced to do is they're forced to find some other leader who's going to protect them. They're forced to band together. So you have multiple villages come together and then just, it, it's, a, it's basically just a function of, of brute survival. For them to survive, they have to come together and they have to organize themselves under some leader. And then that leader has to take control and make decisive actions that are going to ensure the survival of this group of villages, let's say. And on the decisions of that leader is going to hinge the survival of everybody in that community. All the villagers, all the women, all the children, all the men, all the soldiers, all the farmers, all the doctors and intellectuals and scholars, all the uh, uh, politicians, and ultimately he himself is going to lose his head. He, in fact, will be the first one to lose his head if he makes the wrong decisions. So it's a lot of responsibility to put on one person. And it it really matters who that person is. You see? Because if you get some buffoon, some incompetent buffoon, uh, he's not going to make the, the right decisions, and then quickly everybody's going to die. Now that might seem to us now, because we're looking back at it, it might seem like this is a very archaic and brutal system. And it is. But you also have to appreciate the bind that our ancestors were in back then. And I mean, some of them still are. Some of these people still exist on this planet in certain parts of the world. Africa, South America, Asia, and elsewhere. Where we, we have it in, in developed countries, we have the luxury of freedom that was hard won. That now we can kind of like say, oh, well, but... I would never subject myself to some authoritarian, some tyrant. Uh, I would always want to maintain my freedom, the sort of libertarian stance. But this is, this is absurd because your freedom is only valuable to you assuming that you're alive, assuming you don't get overrun by warlords and other tyrants which exist out there in the world. So as long as that's taken care of, then yeah, you can... You can talk about freedom and you can bitch and moan about people infringing on your freedom of speech or some other, you know, Second Amendment rights or whatever that you might feel entitled to. But what you have to understand is that these freedoms, they don't really exist. They have to be invented and they have to be enforced. Otherwise, they are lost very easily. So what happened is that in many cases, these just ordinary people who, you know, think about it a couple thousand years ago, the average farmer, most people a couple thousand years ago were farmers. There was like nothing else to do. There weren't computer programmers. There weren't engineers per se. There weren't scientists. There weren't uh, marketers. There was, there was basically farmers. 90% of people were farmers and then maybe 5% were scholars or mark, uh, something, let's say like... Um, bazaar owners or shopkeepers, that sort of stuff. And then maybe less than 1% were politicians or military leaders and so on. Of course, there were also probably a good chunk of people who were just troops, soldiers, maybe 10% of those or something. Uh, but most people were just ordinary farmers. Now, these farmers, they didn't go to school. They weren't literate because education was very, very expensive. See, you, you have to Remember that education, we take it for granted now in the 21st century, everybody is literate, basically. Everybody goes to school at least 10 years of school, maybe 12 years, maybe 16 years um, in developed countries. But a couple thousand years ago, most people didn't know how to read, didn't know mathematics, didn't know history, had no historical context for things, had no study of philosophy or government or politics. So what do these people really know? They knew nothing except what they learned through direct experience from their family. So you were born, your father and mother were farmers, 
And so what do you know? You only know whatever your father and your mother and your extended family, whatever they knew. So if one of them was a blacksmith, maybe you could have learned some blacksmithing skills. If one of them was a, um, you know, a shopkeeper, you could learn some, maybe some business skills, although they were very crude, uh, this sort of stuff. But most people just knew farming. And that's like all you knew. Try to really put yourself into that position of a farmer from a couple thousand years ago. Like you were so utterly clueless compared to the way that average people are today in the 21st century. There was no internet. There were no books. If there were books, they were extremely expensive and only afforded by the most elite, wealthy aristocrats who were the equivalent of today's millionaires and billionaires. So there were no books. There was no printing press. There was no school. There was no university for you to go to. If, if there was anything even close to that, it, it cost millions of dollars, basically, to send your, your child to a university. You know, you think university is expensive today? Uh, back in the Greek and Roman times, literally you'd have to be a millionaire to send one of your kids off to school for pri private tutoring and this sort of stuff. So what did you as this basic, simple-minded, poor farmer, what did you know how to do? What did you know about the world? What did you know about reality? Almost nothing. It's whatever what was programmed into you by your culture, by your religion, which of course played a huge role for you in shaping your worldview. So you, you clung to your religion and you just did your task and that was it. And you didn't know very much about world affairs. You couldn't go on Facebook and see what's going on today in the world or CNN or anything like that. None of this was available. Like it's, it, we've, We've advanced so much that in a sense, we're now victims of our own advancement because we forget what it really took to get us to where we are today. And that, that makes us take for granted what is allowing us to stay where we are today. And that makes us ignorant of what's coming in the future and what it'll take for us to, to advance to, to new stages in the future. Some of the sacrifices that it takes. See, a lot of sacrifices were made by our ancestors that are completely taken for granted today by us, by libertarians and so forth. So these people, the majority of people were so ignorant that they weren't capable of even casting a ballot for some politician because to cast a ballot for a politician, just to go and vote, you need to be able to read, to write, you need to have a sense of, of civic responsibility. Just the idea that every four years or every two years that you are going to go into some ballot box at some appointed place and you're going to vote for some person and that this is your civic duty to do so and that this, if you don't do so, then somehow you're not um, contributing to the, to the society in the right way. These things had to be invented and developed. They, the technology, this, so it was a combination of a confluence of things. There was the material, physical technology that needed to be invented, such as writing, books, paper, papyrus, whatever your ballot was cast on. Um, and then how to tabulate all these votes. See, even just the very notion that you're gonna, you're gonna get all the people in town to come into town and to vote on a specific day at a specific time, that means you need to invent clocks, calendars. There needs to be a social system, a cultural invention where we all agree that this is something we're gonna do on such and such a date, at such and such a time, that this is, this is like our moral civic duty to do this. All, these, all this infrastructure needs to be built up, you see. People need to understand and make a connection in their mind of like, well, me going to this ballot box and making some, some chicken scratches on this piece of papyrus and putting it in this little box and it's going to be all counted and tallied up. And then you have to like make the connection between that and then the person who's going to, who's going to get elected. And then the person who's elected, how do you know even who you're voting for? Well, you need to have some sort of like marketing system, basically a crude form of marketing so that people know who that person is and they know the alternative, you know, rival candidates, the opponents, then you got to decide who to vote for based on what are you going to decide which of them is the best? Do you have a deep 
knowledge of history and government and politics and human psychology and, and warfare and all of this to understand which person is going to make for the best leader? Do you understand how leadership works? You see, even today, most people don't understand these things. These are very complex and nuanced things to understand in order to make educated decisions. So back then, this was simply impossible. Democracy was simply unsustainable back then. Back then, the situation was that, hey, we've got a, a, a rival army headed our way that's going to be here in two months. We've, we've got some news that it's coming. So we better rally together and build a, a fortress around our villages, uh, build like a wall, defend this wall, raise an army, and, and try to defend ourselves. Otherwise, we're all going to get raped and pillaged and enslaved. That's what would happen. In ancient times, during the times of ancient Rome, times of Caesar, it was well understood by everybody in the city that if a city got sacked, if the perimeter wall between the inner city and the outside of the city was ever broken through, that was the end of the entire city. It wasn't like it is today where the United States invades Iraq, maybe strategically bombs a few power plants and the electrical system, maybe bombs some military installations, maybe accidentally bombs and drones a few you know, civilian buildings and factories. But overall, like 95% of the infrastructure of the city is, is maintained and ordinary people can still go about going to the market, buying their food, going, you know, doing their work and all this sort of stuff can still be maintained. That's not how it was 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, if that city was invaded, all the men would get their throats slit by the invading army, uh, and all the women would be raped, and all the children and women would then later be enslaved uh, or sold off as slaves. And oftentimes, that city, it was either captured and totally... Uh, repurposed maybe for a new military base or a, you know a new outpost for the invading army or it was just completely ransacked and burned to the ground a lot of times that happened because certain cities just hated other cities so much that they wouldn't even want to like live in the city they conquered they would just raise it to the ground or it would just be raised to the ground in the process of invading it and those people who were defending that city they, they weren't just it wasn't just like, oh, well, yeah, some of our military troops might die in this invasion. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> if this city gets invaded, everybody's going to die. Everyone's going to be screwed, including the women, the children, everybody. So understand the stakes that are involved here in this game of politics and government. The stakes are enormous. And these stakes, they still exist. They're just buried today under a lot of infrastructure and bureaucracy, which uh, helps to sort of mask that. And it, it softens the edges of the brutal nature of, of human beings because we have thousands, literally thousands of years of infrastructure and, and, and moral and, and cultural development. It, it, it sort of, it pacifies our brutal nature such that most people aren't going around raping and killing and pillaging. And even most countries aren't really doing that these days. So you see, when you're faced with such stark survival conditions, democracy is a luxury. In fact, it's completely unworkable. What's necessary is very strong leadership and a group of elites Basically, the smartest, strongest people out of your village need to come together and they need to devise a plan because we don't have time to educate all the masses. We don't have time to explain everything to the masses because the masses are mostly stupid. So it's only those few elites, they come together, they form a cabal, which will govern all the mass, the masses, and then they will elect one of theirs as the leader, the authoritarian, the king. And then he's going to be the boss. 
and on him will hinge our future and our our survival. See, now this might seem very unfair from a sort of libertarian perspective, like how dare they do this? And then they impose taxes on all the farmers and we don't even get a say of like who the king is gonna be. And yet we still, we still have to pay the king taxes and give a portion of our, of our grain supply that we generate every, you know, all of our harvest every year. Um, yeah, but that's still highly preferable to getting slaughtered by the enemies that are coming out from from outside and they're coming they're coming because it's a lot easier to come and to conquer some poor defenseless farmers than it is to actually do the hard work of farming for yourself see it's very appealing to go invade other villages and towns if you can just rally enough people together build an army it's very very appealing it's appealing on many levels first of all it's appealing to the ego there are many ambitious, tyrannical people who, you know, want that sort of power, who want to be in that position of conquering others. So in that sense, it's very appealing to spiral dynamic stage red egos. Um, but it's also appealing because, hey, you know, farming is very hard work. Who wants to labor in the fields day after day after day, harvesting fruits and vegetables and, and grain? This is hard work. You'd much rather prefer to invade somebody who's done that work for you and then enslave them and have them keep doing more of that work for you than having having give you a portion of their harvest every single year to support you. See, this is just basic human laziness. We don't want to work. We want to have somebody else work for us. So democracy here is completely unworkable. which is why a large chunk of the developed, rather underdeveloped world, even today, is not democratic. Because democracy is unworkable. It's not so much that the tyrant is this evil person who oppresses the ordinary individual and takes away his rights. It's not so much that. Actually, in a sense, the tyrant and the authoritarian, the king, is doing those farmers and, and ordinary folks uh, a favor because he's taken on a lot of responsibility to make sure that they stay safe. Now, of course, he can abuse his power, but also you can have good kings and there have been uh, examples throughout history of good kings who had a lot of power, a lot of authority, and they used it responsibly. They weren't lazy. They weren't drunkards. They weren't just about having orgies and you know living in luxury and exploiting people underneath them, they were actually like working for the people. There are certain Roman emperors that were like that. And, um, and, and actually quite a few kings throughout history were like that. They fought for their people. They cared about their people a lot. And in fact, that's what you see mostly with authoritarians, even today. Many authoritarians, like we see authoritarians in China, um, Xi Jinping, and he you know, has certain authoritarian tendencies. In, in Russia, we have Putin with certain authoritarian tendencies. In the Philippines, we have Duterte with certain authoritarian tendencies. But these people, what are they really fighting for? Sure, some of them love the power. Of course they do. But uh, I would say that most of these people aren't in it for the power, per se. Uh, they are actually patriots. They really care about their nation. Their nation, they see that amongst all the other nations in the world, their, their nation is not at the top. Um, they see how much better their nation could be. They see that their nation is getting exploited by others like America and other European powers, which are, which are stronger than them. They're, they're getting exploited. They're getting the raw end of the deal. And so it's like their patriotic duty to take on that responsibility to not just sit around and wait for people to democratize themselves and to fix this problem for them, but to take the reins and to fix it yourself. Have you ever found yourself in a position or in a small group of people where there's maybe five or 10 of you, and then you notice that most of the people in that group, they're meek. Some important decision needs to be made, but, but it's like a committee thinking. Nobody's making any clear, strong decisions. There's no sense of leadership. People are just kind of waffling around, throwing around ideas, debating each other, 
bickering with each other, gossiping with each other, but like nothing is getting done in the meantime. Nobody is willing to step up and take responsibility. Everybody's blaming somebody else, but nobody's doing anything about it. They're talking, but they're not doing anything about it. So what you have to do is you have to step up in that situation and you have to say, I'm going to be the leader. I'm going to take responsibility. And now, of course, what happens? Some of the people in that group will say, oh, well, but who said that you're going to be the leader? I don't like you as the leader, blah, 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 blah. And then they bitch and moan and they gossip amongst themselves about how you shouldn't be the leader. Well, okay, if I'm not the leader, then who is the leader? Say, well, maybe that person should be the leader. But then as soon as that person is picked out, somebody else in the group will say, oh, but I don't like him because of this and this and that. And then they'll start to fight with each other over that. You see, so uh, part of the, the challenge of of selecting a leader, in a certain sense, the leader is going to be the one who steps up, who steps up and anoints himself as the leader. This, of course, takes some gall, some arrogance, some ego, some ambition, and some confidence to be able to, to do that. Because we could always say, well, who appointed you king? And in the end, you have to say, I appoint myself king. And then whether that actually works or not will depend on how strong you are as a person. If you're a weak person, you'll be dethroned very quickly. Usually it takes a vicious person, a highly ambitious, highly vicious, ruthless person to take that position. Because what's going to happen is that as soon as you stand up and say, I'm going to be king, I'm going to lead us, here's my vision. There's going to be at least a few people in the group who will challenge you and question your vision and will not agree with your vision and will try to stop you. Even though they themselves may not want to take that position as king and as leader. And maybe they don't have a good vision, but they will sit back and they will whine and moan and bitch about how your vision is not going to work. So oftentimes what you have to do is you have to just fight those people and conquer them. Win them over to your side. You can do it through diplomacy. You can do it with money. You can do it uh, with with rhetoric, with, you know, a motivational speech, you can convince them. But when all of that fails, you can also use reason, of course. When all of that fails, uh, you're going to have to defeat them physically. Which is why authoritarians are known to be bloodthirsty and vicious. Oftentimes, gassing their own people, killing their own associates and colleagues and political rivals who are friends of theirs, playing these sorts of games of throne, because that's what's necessary in that kind of environment to come out on top and then to, to unify a diverse group of, of people who have their own agendas, unify them together. The unification is absolutely crucial in order for us to survive. I have an episode. Uh, I'm actually going to be bringing up multiple prior concepts from old episodes that I've talked about that are important here. We're going to be synthesizing a lot in this, in this conversation here about democracy. Um, I have an episode called uh, Unity versus Division where I talk about how the structure of all of reality is that things are getting divided and separated and then getting reunified back together. And that this is a, a fractal process that is happening at all scales and levels of reality. Well, of course, it's happening within uh, the formation of societies and governments. Because what we start off with is our sort of default state is a, is a, a loose, diverse collection of individuals and small clans and tribes. And then we unify them. If we unify them, we get more strength because now we can organize all these tribes to work in a coordinated manner to build something larger than a tribe, something more like a, a state or a country, a nation. But how do you, you unify all these people who have diverse cultures, maybe different ethnic backgrounds, different religions, different belief systems, different economic ideas about how things should be structured, 
different ideas about the military. How do you bring all of that together under one banner and have them act towards one common purpose, such as, for example, building a fortification around the perimeter to defend all of those folks from outside invaders? Or how do you get them all working towards some sort of larger public project like building a pyramid or building a temple, which costs a lot of resources, uh, thousands of, of man years and man hours go into that to build something as great as a pyramid? Well, you can't build something as great as a pyramid with just a couple of tribes. You need to unify giant groups of people small groups into into much larger groups and then those the groups is even larger groups you know you got, you got to unify before you can start to build great monuments and really build amazing feats of architecture and infrastructure you can't build a lot of fancy roads and marble courtyards and fountains and, and great cities unless you're able to defend all that stuff and also you're able to tax people and you're able to get people to buy into that vision because you know one person might say well Let's build a pyramid, guys. Another person in the tribe might say, well, no, a pyramid is stupid. Let's build a cube instead of a pyramid. And then somebody else says, no, not a cube. Let's build a sphere. Well, which one are we going to do? And if we just let people bicker back and forth and argue with each other about what we're going to do endlessly, then what we get is we get the sort of problem that stage green actually faces. Um, and we're seeing a bit of that today in the news and in our politics. One of the problems with stage green, spiral dynamic stage green, is that it's sort of that hippie uh, social justice warrior type of mentality. And we're, we're seeing, you know, in recent news that they 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 took over some some chunk of Seattle and they, they created this CHAZ zone, C-H-A-Z, um, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. And it's sort of like this uh, this hippie commune type of vibe, a little little town in the middle of the city and they sort of cordon it off and now they're offering you know free this and free that it's sort of this almost like burning man kind of culture taking place there and in a certain sense it's cool it's nice but the problem with that it's it's a very loosely distributed hierarchy it's a flat hierarchy there there's nobody who's the boss at stage green and one of the problems and negative downsides of stage green is that when you get a bunch of green people together in a group they're so concerned about gathering a consensus, not offending anybody in the group and being nice and cordial and, and accommodating to everybody in the group that you have this committee thinking where no clear decisions get made. No strong vision comes out. You can get a, you know, 20 people, 20 green people into a room and have them sit there for 24 hours in that room trying to decide, you know, okay, what's going to be our project that we're working on? What's going to be our next business idea? Let's say it's a small startup and everybody's just sitting around and they're just throwing around, you know, spitballing stuff. They can be s sitting there for a week spitballing stuff. And still at the end of all that, there's no clear decision made. Maybe you've experienced that in some of your corporate uh, experiences. If you work in, in, in corporations, uh, sometimes you're going to do a meeting or you'll be doing meetings all day, but then these meetings happen. You sit there, you spend hours discussing stuff, but at the end of the day, nothing gets resolved. That's because that shows you uh, that just endless deliberation in a flat hierarchy has its limits. It can be valuable to have someone who's like a director, a creative director or a manager or the CEO who comes in there and, and kind of sets the agenda and says, okay, we have five hours. We're going to discuss for five hours, but at the end of this five hours, we are going to have a, a concrete plan for what we're going to be doing. And here are the specific values that we're going to be using to, to, to guide us towards what our decision is going to be. That can be very helpful because you can't just sit around and endlessly deliberate about what to do next. Sometimes not making a decision is the worst decision you can make. And that's especially true when you have some horde of warlords and marauders coming to pillage and raise your little town to the ground in a few months. You need very clear, decisive action, which is the function that the authoritarian is playing there. And that is exactly the function that people like Putin, Duterte, Xi Jinping and other uh, authoritarians uh, around the world 
are playing today. It's, it's, it's easy sometimes for Americans, American political pundits to say like, oh, well, Putin is this evil dictator and the Chinese, you know, uh, the Chinese leaders also now starting to become this dictator and so forth, taking on power. But you have to consider the environment that they're, that they're in. You see, they're playing catch up. Those countries are still highly underdeveloped, like Russia, China, the Philippines. They need a lot of decisive, strong action, bold, visionary leadership in order to get them up to parity with the United States, with Europe, and uh, other parts of the world. You see? And this is a double-edged sword, because of course, when someone gets a lot of power, they have a lot of power to do good, but they also have an equal amount of power to do evil. And of course, oftentimes they get corrupted by that power and they end up doing more evil than good. One of the problems we have now in the United States is in a sense, we've become so democratic. Everybody has a say now to the point where there's no clear vision of what America is shooting towards or working towards anymore. We're very fragmented politically and ideologically. Half of us want to go in this direction, half of us want to go in that direction, and it's actually worse than that because it's not just two, two forces. There's, there's many, many different forces tugging and pulling in different directions, and there's no real strong, clear leadership. And in a sense, America has become so complacent now because we've got a decent democracy, but it could still be much better. But we don't have, like, so much of the power in America is distributed. It's distributed between the Supreme Court, the executive branch, the, uh, the Congress, the, you know, the Senate and the, the House. And then it's distributed to the media and it's distributed to business and corporations and it's distributed to, you know, civil rights leaders. So like the power has gotten so distributed that everyone believes that they should have a say as to what is best for, for the country going forward. And in a sense, what's happening is that when, when you have 10 different forces equally pulling in 10 different directions, the net result of that is a movement of zero. You stay in place. And then you stagnate. And that actually, that actually ends up being the worst thing you can do after a certain while is just stagnating because other countries are moving forward. They have a sense of direction. See, so one of the myths we need to bust about democracy is this idea that democracy is a unmitigated positive thing. And that, more and more democracy is just better and better and better automatically. And that authoritarianism is just bad automatically. This is, a, this is a simplistic fairy tale that they taught you in school. When you really start to look at how politics works, it's, it's incredibly ingenious and intelligent. There's not a lot of room for fluff and ineffectiveness in politics. Politics is so derided and it's called dirty and, and, and all this precisely because it's so ruthlessly effective. See, it has to be, it has to be extremely pragmatic and survival oriented. And of course this, this ends up going full circle and kind of biting it in the ass. Cause when you get so pragmatic and survival oriented that then, you know, you lose your humanity in doing that. So, so part of the challenge of life is that, again, bringing in my episodes about understanding survival, part one and part two, which are very important. Make sure you watch those. We're always in this very delicate balancing act. We're, we're, it's like we're trying to balance a knife on, on its point, on, on a flat glass surface. We're trying to balance because, you know, if we go too much to one direction, then we're going to, we're going to stray too far away from survival, we're going to die as a species or as a group, as a society. But if we stray too much towards the other direction where we're just only concerned about our survival and nothing else, then we become savages 
and um, all sorts of evil happens. And that also ends up destroying us, you see, because too much selfishness will destroy you and too much selflessness will also destroy you. So reality is all about balancing that knife on its point very delicately. And this is both collectively and individually as well. This, you know, brings in my episode about collective ego. There's a sort of a self-similarity between, as I talked about in that episode, between the individual human life, your life, personal development and so forth, what's happening with you, and then what's happening collectively in your society, in your family, in, in your company, in corporation, and in your nation, and in the whole globe for humans as a, as a species. There's similarities there. One of the similarities is that we're both of us individually and collectively are trying to balance that knife delicately between being not too selfish and not too selfless. Because if we go too much in one direction, the knife is going to fall over and everything's going to collapse and then we die. So here's sort of my general simplified story of the rise from authoritarianism to democracy. So if we go 2,000 years ago, rewind the clock to ancient Rome and Greece, what we see is that even though there was talk of, you know, the Athenian democracy, the Athenian democracy collapsed pretty quickly and it quickly turned into an, actually an authoritarian uh, state. And the reason it did is because the democracy wasn't sustainable in Athens. And probably one of the reasons it wasn't sustainable is because the people weren't selfless enough, weren't conscious enough, weren't developed enough to sustain it. It was a good idea and it lasted for a short while, but then eventually um, authoritarianism took over. And it took over for, for hundreds and, and even thousands of years through the Middle Ages and then beyond that. So in the last 200 years, especially, what we've seen in America and in Europe is we've seen a softening, a moving away from kings, kingships, and authoritarian states towards more democracy. And this is good. In, this, in a sense, this, this e equalized a lot because... For thousands of years, we had rigid caste systems, the way that they still do in India, but we had it in Europe as well. Um, we had separations between the aristocrats and the sort of the plebs and the serfs and the slaves and the working class versus the, the elites and the clergy and the, the, you know, the aristocracy, all of this. These, these boundaries, they all started to get dissolved after the French Revolution and then you know, continuing up to the 21st century till today. Every single decade, every single century, basically, power has become more and more distributed, taken away from aristocrats and elites, and given to ordinary people. So in a sense, this is a great trend, because today society is more equal and fair than it's ever been. We have the least racism that we've ever had, the least slavery in the world that, that we've ever had, the least uh, raping and pillaging that, than we've ever had in human history um, since the rise of major civilizations. Um, the least, uh, you know, animal cruelty that we've ever had. Uh, the least environmental destruction that we've ever had. So, you know, people say, oh, we're destroying the environment. Well, yeah, we are destroying the environment, of course. But in a sense, people... 2,000 years ago were much less environmentally friendly than we are today. They just didn't have the enormous scale and the technology that we have today. You know, and not everybody didn't have a car back then. But if they did, they would all drive it and they wouldn't give a shit about what it did to the environment. This idea that ancient people care about the environment, this is, this is absurd. You only start to care about the environment once you get to spirodynamic stage green and, and higher. People Below that, at lower stages, they don't have a sort of a systemic ecological consciousness. The, the only extent to which they don't destroy their environment is simply because they don't have the power yet. They haven't become so developed that they haven't developed the technology and the scale, the sheer numbers. You know, it's easy to live ecologically when you're living in a tribe of 100 people. Pretty easy. You can just shit in the river. The river will carry your shit downstream into the ocean. No problem. 
because relative to the size of the planet, 100 people is nothing. Same thing with animals. You know, some people say, oh, Leo, but how dare you say that animals are below humans in their development? Animals are actually more developed because they live so peacefully and harmoniously with nature. <laughs> no, they don't. The only reason animals live harmoniously with nature is simply because they haven't developed the capacity to outstrip nature. And in those areas where they have developed that capacity, you know, like you have a giant locust swarm that will just, uh, you know, fly through some forest or th through some grassland and just eat everything in its sight and then eventually just d dies of, of starvation because it's eaten everything that it can. There are examples of that happening in, in nature as well. So don't think the, these animals somehow care about nature. They don't. They're acting completely selfishly and unconsciously. It's just that uh, for them, living harmoniously with nature is sort of automatic because if they don't, they're automatically killed by nature. So that sort of solves that problem rather quickly for them. Uh, and so, yeah, so like for the ancient Greeks, it was fairly easy to live harmoniously with nature because they, they didn't have nuclear weapons, they didn't have cars, they didn't have oil refineries and all this sorts of stuff. And their scale was so small that we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, maybe a million people at most. But today we're talking about billions of people who are all driving cars. And actually this is the consequence of democracy. See, because if only a king got to drive a car or a fly on a commercial jet, then we'd have no environmental problems. The environmental problems are precisely a problem of scale. When you have 7 billion people and we give them a lot of democracy, which means that these people get to control their own life. They are uh, relatively well off economically. They're not slaves. They're not plebs. Uh, they have disposable income that they can use to travel, which means they use airplanes. Um, they have their own vehicles. Many times they have multiple vehicles. They have their SUVs. They can buy Hummers and other, you know, gas guzzling cars and all this. So you got to supply them with, with trillions of, of barrels of oil every year and all this sorts of stuff. Yeah, then you have an ecological catastrophe on your hands that's coming. So what's been happening in the last couple hundred years is that there's been a rapid democratization for thousands of years. Humans were just content to basically live under kings and aristocrats. The king and these aristocrats, and maybe these aristocrats were like 5 or 10% of the population, they had the majority of the wealth. And there was so little social mobility that it was impossible for you, if you were born into a farmer family, to ever become an aristocrat. Never, basically. Now today, we still have a lot of inequality. Our democracy is not perfect. And in fact, one of the lessons I want you to take away from this discussion is that democracy has so many degrees. In a sense, don't even think of human society as either being autocratic or elitist or aristocratic, or democratic. There's not these categories. Really, what you have is you have one single scale. This scale represents democracy, in a sense. And this scale also correlates to some degree with consciousness and with development. So as we start to crank up the consciousness and the development of human beings, of human minds, basically, democracy becomes more important and more necessary. Because the more conscious you are, the less you're willing to be subjugated by somebody else. And also, the more conscious you are, the less, the less willing you are to subjugate other people. Because that no longer pleases you either. You actually want others to be on your level. You want to help raise up others around you to also be conscious and loving and to have the opportunities that you have. See? Because also along this scale, what we have is we have democracy going this way, we have consciousness going this way, and we have 
selflessness going this way, and we have love. It's all going in this direction. Now, they might not be perfectly correlated. You can think of these as like separate toggles on a mixing board. You're dragging them in this direction, but generally what that does is that, that it sort of raises the volume of the entire soundtrack, so to speak. Um, so if we take ancient Rome and Greece, it was down here. If we take the Middle East, it's down here. And then as we move to more developed countries over the centuries, in Europe and America and elsewhere, everything is moving generally in this direction. Now, it's not always just purely moving with no backsliding. It moves, it backslides, it moves, it backslides, it oscillates. But as it oscillates, it moves upwards. So we've got this upwards oscillating curve, you might say. Um, uh, and so, really what we're talking about when we're talking about society and government and creating a better country is we're talking about creating a better country for everybody, a more equal, more fair, more softened environment in which all of us can prosper together. That's what we're really talking about. But of course, what we have is we have our own nature, which interferes with us getting what we want. The only ones we have to blame for the structure of our society and culture is ourselves. You see, we created it. We invented it. So why is it that we created these authoritarian structures that are unfair and unequal and distribute resources to the top and so forth, enslave people and so forth? Uh, because that's all that our level of consciousness could sustain. If we were more conscious, if we were more selfless, if we were more loving, if we were more developed, if we were more educated, then we could sustain a higher, more equi equitable distribution of resources and power. Then individual people could have more autonomy. But when our consciousness is low, we're basically close to the level of development of an animal. And the way that you govern animals is harshly with a whip. Because an animal doesn't understand anything but a whip. If you have a vicious animal. And so, it's a mistake to blame simply the, the despots, tyrants, and autocrats who are supposedly responsible, or like the elites. It's popular today, I hear this. The, there's a lot of populism in the air today. Right-wing populism, left-wing populism, and this is popular to blame the elite media, or the elite Democrats, or the elite Republicans, or the elite business class, or the, the Silicon Valley elites, or the Wall Street elites, or the, you know, the Jews who are running the world elites, this sort of conspiracy stuff. Um, or just even conspiracy theories are so popular today. It's like, oh, Bill Gates is, you know, doing something behind the scenes. George Soros is doing something behind the scenes. The Koch brothers are doing something behind the scenes, you know, to manipulate all this. And it's all their fault. But this is, this is really um, a shirking of responsibility. In fact, it's this sort of mindset where you're trying to blame these elites for the state of our society. It's actually this mindset, which is a low level of consciousness and understanding that prevents you from taking responsibility over your contribution to the problem. Because what it does is it sort of separates you. It says, well, I'm not the problem. I'm the ordinary citizen. I'm not the problem. It's the elites. It's Bill Gates who's the problem. No, 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 no. It's not Bill Gates who's the problem. It's you, the average person who's the problem. It's your own lack of development, your own selfishness, your own fear, your own susceptibility to conspiracy thinking your own lack of systemic understanding of these complex and subtle issues, your own lack of education, your own unwillingness to actually go and read some books on politics and government and history to actually study this stuff carefully. That's really the problem. Of course, I'm not saying the elites are innocent. They, they also contribute to the problem because they're part of the system. Everyone's part of the same system. So it's not about blaming some one part of the system is about seeing sort of the, the meta of what's really going on, how we're getting in our own way. So, over the, these last hundred years, 
a lot of stuff has become democratized. Voting at the ballot box has become democratized. Now we have women who are allowed to vote. We have gay people who are allowed to vote. We have black people who are allowed to vote, foreigners who are allowed to vote, people of different religions who are allowed to vote. Poor people are also allowed to vote. Now, of course, it's not all fair. There is still shenanigans and gerrymandering and, and you know, this sort of stuff. It's still happening. There's still racism within the voting system, systemic racism, and so forth. Yes, all this stuff is still there to a degree, but it's gotten a lot better than where it was. You have to admit. But it wasn't just the voting that got more democratized. Uh, everything, in a sense, has become more democratized. The economy has become more democratized. Believe it or not. You might say, oh, Leo, but how can you say that? In the 1950s, you know, you could just go work a decent job in America and earn a decent wage, you know, at, at a normal job. Today, you can't do that because you have millionaires and billionaires who have sucked up. Yeah, that's happened to some degree. But still, um, considering how unequal the economy was 100 years ago or 200 years ago, it's a lot better today than it was back then. Overall, today, people have more opportunity, more freedom to move up the social hierarchy. It's easier to become a millionaire or a billionaire today than it ever was in the past, because in the past, you had to be part of a millionaire or billionaire family. Today, that's less important because technology allows you to create something amazing and then to earn, you know, you can create a billion dollar company within 10 years today. It was very hard to do that uh, 100 or 200 years ago. Um, and of course, so the economy has become more democratized. You have more control over who you can work for. You have more control over what kind of career you want. And a lot of that has to do with also the democratization of technology and education. So technology also has become more distributed. Whereas in the past, the most advanced technology was only available to the, to the wealthiest people. Today, highly advanced technologies are actually some of the most um, accessible. The most advanced computers and cell phones and so forth, they're pretty cheap and they're designed for mass market. So a lot of technology has been democratized. You know, everybody has access to a microwave, to a refrigerator, to a telephone, to a TV, to the internet. And the internet has been a huge development in the last 20 years, which has led to, to a massive democratization of information and knowledge. Whereas before it was elite scholars in universities and in various kinds of esoteric sects uh, that had all the information and knowledge, and it would cost you thousands or millions of dollars to access this knowledge, and you had to have the right social class and status to access it. Now it's easy. Online you go, you can look up any fact, basically, that you want to. You can, uh, you can buy any book with... With $20, you can basically buy any book in the world that you want to get it shipped to your door for free. Um, you can take online courses. You can go to, you can take Harvard classes through the internet. You don't need to even to apply to Harvard anymore. Um, so it's all getting democratized, and this is amazing. And you have access to news instantly. You know, a thousand years ago, you didn't know if there was some 9 11 a thousand years ago, you wouldn't even know about it as some stupid poor farmer. Now, today, you click on Facebook and you see everything immediately. So, this is all great, but of course, now you're trying to reconcile the, everything I'm telling you. You're trying to reconcile this with sort of the bleak picture that you're seeing now in, in the news. You say, well, Leo, if, if all this you're, that you're saying is true, then how come we're facing all these problems? How come we're facing the rise of Trump? How come we're facing the alt-right? How come we're facing these neocons? How come we have these... Uh, you know, KKK and all this racism, and how come we have these police shooting black people, and how come we have, you know, the coronavirus, and we have all this stuff, and we have rising income inequality, and we have healthcare problems, and, you know, we have um, politicians cheating in the election systems and gerrymandering and blah, 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 blah. Yes, of course we have all of that. What you first and foremost have to understand is how much worse it was for your ancestors. All these things that you're bitching and moaning and complaining about today, 
that you think are so terrible that are the end of the world. You think these are signs of the apocalypse. Uh, that some black guy got shot. And you think this is the, the end of the world. <laughs> That's not the end of the world. <laughs> Mankind has survived such horror in the past. That makes coronavirus and these police protests and riots and stuff and looting. This makes it look like, like kindergarten. This is child's play. Our ancestors would look at this with envy at how good we have it. Now, this is not to discount the importance of, of handling the coronavirus intelligently, unlike what Trump is doing, and the importance of you know, wearing face masks, and the importance of not looting, and the importance of not shooting innocent black people, and so, so forth. These are all important causes, so I'm not, um, I'm not simplistically discounting the importance of you know, fighting systemic racism and so forth. All of that is important. I'm just trying to put it into some perspective for you, some historical, larger perspective, the perspective of the entire human species in our entire history, which has been very brutal and, and, uh, and vicious. I mean, human history is so brutal that it's impossible to capture the brutality and horror of it, the selfishness of it on paper. Like, human history is just atrocious. When you look at all the slavery, the pillaging, the raping, the genocide, the, you know, the wars, the World War I and World War II and all the wars that came before and afterwards, um, the torture and the, uh, the imprisonment and the, the massacres and just war crimes that have happened public executions, private executions, horrible weapons of all kinds used on the battlefield for centuries, plagues that wiped out up to a third or even half of the European population. So, you know, our ancestors have been through a lot of shit. And that survival DNA, it's coded into your genetics and my genetics. We're here, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. All that, all that survival history is, in a sense, what's making us so egotistical and selfish today. It's sort of one of our biggest obstacles to overcome that survival karma of our ancestors. Because all of that is coded in our DNA. It's also coded in our culture, in our infrastructure. It's got a very long tail. Shit that happened thousands of years ago, it's still informing our culture and our society today. Never mind something like the Civil War and slavery, which is only a couple hundred years old. Of course, all that st is still with us today in, in very subconscious ways. So... Humanity as a species is developing and growing and becoming more conscious, more loving, more selfless. We've got a long way to go. We're still, in a sense, in the Dark Ages. But we've also made it pretty damn far. And life overall is pretty damn good. Even if you're poor, still, life is pretty damn good. You still have opportunity. Um... No matter what race, class, or sex you have, you have you have pretty decent opportunity. Now, is it all fair and equal? No, of course not. There's a lot of corruption and inequality, and it's harder for some than for others. It might be harder for women than for men. Maybe it's harder for blacks than for whites. Maybe it's harder for gays than for straights. Maybe it's even harder for transgender people than it is for normal people. Yeah, of course, there's, there's a lot of this stuff. And all of that will get smoothened out with time, because that is the trend line throughout human history is an increase in, in democracy. But uh, you have to also appreciate what democracy really means here. Democracy is not all rainbows and butterflies. As you democratize society, move it away from elitism and authoritarianism, what happens is um, counterintuitive things happen. Fragmentation happens. So ironically, when a dictator comes to power, in ancient Rome, like Augustus, the, one of the 
first Roman emperors, one of the most effective Roman emperors, because he was so managerial and so controlling. Also, a brilliant strategist. Um, so as that, the emperor, what does the emperor do? The emperor unifies, like I said. Unifies, gives a coherent vision in a singular sense of direction. This can be very, very powerful because you can effectively get a lot of stuff done. You can build temples and uh, win wars and build cities. But also, if that vision is wrong, it, it can go south very quickly, too. So there's a double-edged sword there. But as more and more people become educated, we all become more developed, democratized, power goes away from the emperor and gets distributed to ordinary people. That means ordinary people like you and me, who are not kings or politicians or aristocrats, we get more ability to control our own lives. We can be more creative, we can be more autonomous, we can travel more, we can spend our money more, we have more money to spend, and, and so on. But as that happens, each of us now becomes like our own little mini tyrant. It doesn't automatically solve the problem. In fact, what it does is it sort of fractures society. Society now breaks apart into factions. When you don't have one strong force to unite people together, sometimes through vicious force, when you don't have that, people will naturally tend to break apart into cliques and factions that then start to fight with each other. This becomes quite wasteful in terms of wasting a lot of energy. And we're seeing this today with American politics. Back in the 1950s and 60s, one of the things that made America great back then, in a sense that America was predominantly spiral dynamic stage blue. America was unified by a certain culture of uh, Judeo-Christian values. Many of the conservative values that conservatives pine for today, the whole appeal of Trump's, you know, make America great again, this idea of going back to the 1950s and 60s where America was simpler, it was more white, it was more Protestant, Judeo-Christian. Um, there wasn't so much political turmoil. There wasn't this, this rank partisanship that we have today. In a sense, there's, there's some truth to that. And the reason that was, was because we were at Spilodynamic Stage Blue back then, for the most part which means that we were more unified by a single religion, a single set of values, which kind of shaped our sense as a nation, as a civilization. We were very nationalist. So when we were fighting off enemies like Nazi Germany or communist Russia or communist China or communist Korea, something like this, or communist Vietnam, you see, we had outside enemies and we kind of rallied together as Americans under sort of a cohesive idea of, you know, maybe it's American patriotism, the founding father, you know, whatever is the American narrative. So we sort of came together under that. We all sort of agreed on that. And, um, and we were actually able to be quite effective. But then what happened was that after that, the democratization continued. And we started moving beyond Sparrow Dynamics Stage Blue into Orange. Orange is more business-oriented, more individualistic. The Sparrow Dynamics Pendulum swings, if you watch my Sparrow Dynamics series, it swings from individualist stages to collectivist stages back to individualist stages. So Stage Blue was the 1950s and 60s was a collectivist stage, which many conservatives don't understand today because many conservatives today are actually in stage orange, which is individualistic. And they think that, oh, everybody was individualistic back during the World War II era. No, they were very collectivist. In a sense, individualism was very suppressed during the 1950s and 60s. There was more of a sense of America as a sort of a, a higher identity that all of us subsumed ourselves to. But then the pendulum swung after that with the baby boomer generation, the pendulum started swinging more towards individualism. There was the rise of consumerism, the rise of marketing that appealed to every individual consumer, the rise of technology, 
the rise of luxury, um, and then also what opened up after the 60s is uh, with the counterculture revolution, the hippie psychedelic revolution of the 1960s, which is very, very significant. I'll talk about that in a separate episode, the significance of the uh, psychedelic revolution of the 60s. Uh, that opened up stage green. So you see, as we move higher up the spiral, as we develop more, as we become more democratic, what that means is that that opens up more room for voices, suppressed and marginalized voices to come to power and to speak their truths and to put forth their survival agenda. So as we bring more people into the melting pot, and give them a voice. Now we have to start to listen to their voice. So, you know, you bring in women, now you have to listen to women. You bring in blacks, now you have to listen to blacks. You bring in Asians, now you have to listen to Asians. You bring in gay people, now you have to listen to a gay people, and you have to treat them all as equal to your own. If you're white. Now you say, well, that's great. It is great, but it also comes with problems. Because now you have to spend a lot more time listening to different perspectives and voices. And now, the unified monoculture that used to exist in America or in other countries, it starts to crumble and fragment. What was once unified under a great pressure, now when the pressure has been removed, it starts to slack and fall apart and break apart into fragments. To disintegrate. And that is, in a sense, what we're experiencing now in the last, let's say, 10 or 20 years of American society, we're starting to experience this sort of disintegration. Different stages on the spiral are starting to fight with each other. Because now, we're not all predominantly a sage blue. Now, maybe a third of us are at blue, a third of us are at orange, and a third of us are at green. Now, we're pulling in three separate directions. Now, with the rise of the internet, information has become democratized. The news media is becoming democratized. Whereas 30, 40 years ago, you had a couple of cable news shows on TV that everybody listened to and everybody got their information from and everybody agreed, you know, when some, you know, Walter Cronkite or somebody on, on the evening news came on, everybody watched him, everybody thought he was a decent guy. Everybody just listened to what he said about Vietnam or about the Soviets or whatever, the communists, whatever, and everybody agreed. And that was actually un a unifying force for the whole country. But what's happened since then is we've had now, we don't have a couple of cable channels, we have hundreds of cable channels. Now we have not just TV, we have radio, we have satellite radio, we have podcasts, we have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have online blogs and websites and whatever you want. You can go start a blog, a website, a podcast, start talking and preaching about your religion, your philosophy, your ideology, your latest conspiracy theory, your opinion, your criticism of the news, your criticism of elites and so forth. So this is a democratization of information and media. But the problem is, is when you have a bunch of ignorant people and you start to give them power, you can't just assume that that's automatically a good thing. It's like giving power to children. And in a sense, that's what's happening today. So one of the reasons that we're seeing a bit of a backlash and a bit of a, some of the negative effects of this democratization, because you would think like, well, Leo, the way you've been describing it up to now, everything should be honky-dory and peachy and, uh, and positive. We shouldn't be seeing all this strife and conflict, but actually no, that's exactly what you should be seeing is strife and conflict as democracy increases, at least for now, temporarily. You should be seeing more conflict because people are getting a sense of their own power, but they, they haven't really developed a responsible relationship with this power yet. They don't know how to use it responsibly. These people are still children and yet you're giving them enormous power. Oftentimes these people are morons and idiots, and yet you're giving them a lot of power. Any moron and idiot 
can now go and start a podcast and start ranting about the latest conspiracy theory about whatever. Any selfish devil can go on Facebook, open an account and start running ads with some misinformation campaign, some, you know, doctor deep fake videos that are sensationalized to get clicks and to delude people and to subvert democracy. Any moron who hasn't thought deeply and studied deeply history and how government works can go and start a podcast or a YouTube channel and start rave, ranting and raving about the, the idiot elites who are mismanaging the country. Even though this person who's ranting and raving has zero governing, governing experience, zero deep understanding about how governance works, how politics works. And so he's ranting and raving about his favorite enemies who he's demonized. And he's going to infect the minds of millions of his followers with that same toxic ideology, that conspiratorial thinking that's going to start to eat away at the, the, the institutions and the, the bureaucratic foundations, which are actually the pillars that are supporting the entire system of democracy, you see, but he's ignorant without understanding what he's doing and his followers are ignorant and don't understand what they're listening to and how they're being brainwashed by it. And who's to say which of these news sources and media sources is the right one? Does Leo get to decide? Does the president get to decide? Does your, does your church leader get to decide? Does your professor get to decide? Does your mother or father get to decide? Do you get to decide? See, when everybody gets to decide for themselves, now we have this problem of Ken Wilber calls it a perspectival madness. What happened was that before most people at stage blue were just sort of forced into seeing the world through the perspective of stage blue of the society that they were born into. So if you were born into America in the 1960s, like a baby boomer, you saw the world according to sort of the American mythos, whatever that was. It was a very artificial way of looking at the world, but everybody sort of got imprinted with that way of looking at the world. If you're born today, you know, a millennial or whatever the next generation is after that, um, now there's, there's so much diversity. There's so much more diversity in perspectives. You could become a neo-Nazi, you could become a neocon, an alt-right person, you could become a libertarian, you can become some anti-fascist, you can become, there's so much, there's so many different perspectives now that are, that are considered um, acceptable and that are, that are easily accessible. You can access the books, the websites, the blogs, the podcasts, whatever you want. You can create your own echo chamber that will feed back to you exactly whatever you want to think the world is like. So if you think that Jews, elite Jews are controlling the world, you can find sources of information that will feed all that back to you as confirmation bias. And then you'll really become convinced that you're right. And if you're some conservative, you can find a conservative news source that will just feed back to you everything that you want. And you will then just get entrenched in that. And if you're a liberal, you can find a liberal news source that will feed everything back to you, create this echo chamber, and then you're going to be stuck in that and unable to see the world in, in, in any other way. And in a sense, now there's no daddy figure. There's no ultimate authority figure to tell average citizens what to believe, what's true anymore. See, one of the functions of the king in the past, or the pope, and oftentimes, the position of the king and the pope were interchangeable or they were held by the same person, basically. The religious chief and the military chief and the political chief, they were oftentimes one person. Divine monarchs, they called it in Europe, uh, where the king was the head of the church and the state. Or they could be separate people. But anyways, you had, you had in the past, you had a couple of big daddy authority figures who told you what was true and what was false, what was good and what was evil, what was acceptable and what was unacceptable, what was decent and what was indecent, what was an ex uh, a reasonable perspective and what was an insane or a criminal perspective. But 
as democracy is happening, those big daddy authority figures are going away. They're getting questioned. And it's right to question them because, of course, what they were peddling us, they weren't peddling us absolute truth. Nothing that some king or pope says is the absolute truth. It's just one perspective. That's right. But in a sense, it was functional and it was useful, at least in that time in human development, because we needed one source of truth, one source of morality in the past, because that's what unified us in order to overcome the survival challenges that we faced, which were very serious. Today, the survival challenges have largely been overcome. Most of us are not in imminent threat of getting, you know, ransacked by a neighboring country, raped and pillaged. Most of us don't live under that threat. So in that sense, we've sort of transcended and overcome those survival challenges, but we have new survival challenges. Now our survival challenge is how do we survive together while allowing all of us to be so diverse? See, in the past, if you lived in a society a thousand years ago, everybody in your town, in your village, and in your nation probably had the same religion. Probably pray to the same God. Probably went to the same church. Probably had the same ideas about race, ethnicity, homosexuality, economics, politics, and other things. It was this sort of siloed, narrow culture. Very nationalistic and ethnocentric. People didn't even know that there were nations or cultures outside of their culture. Because a thousand years ago, there were no jet airplanes, there were no atlases, there were no uh, doc nature documentaries or documentaries about other countries. There was no internet. You couldn't interact with an Indian person or a Chinese person or a South American person the way that you can today. There was no international media. So nowadays, you know, everybody watches Hollywood movies, and Hollywood movies are very diverse. There are Hollywood movies about homosexuality, there's Hollywood movies about racism, there's Hollywood movies about whites and blacks and Asians and, and uh, uh, Chinese and Japanese and Africans and even aliens. And, and so this Hollywood culture now has become global culture, but what it's done is it's exposed these siloed, narrow cultures to other cultures. Now, even if you live in Africa in some little village, you've probably seen some, you know, Hollywood movies. And those Hollywood movies have, have exposed you to new ways of life. You've seen gay married men, which you would never see in some African village. You, you see it in a Hollywood movie. Or you see some, you know, some Asian person living some weird Asian lifestyle through some YouTube video that you would never have seen if you were living in Africa a thousand years ago or whatever. And so th this amount of diversity is difficult to hold together. Think of it almost like a small family, small family of four, where you have the mother, two children, and the father. The father is extremely domineering, almost to the point of being abusive. He physically will beat the wife if she doesn't do what he says, and he will beat the children too. And he has a gun, and they know it, and he won't hesitate to use it if they get really out of hand. And so in this situation, um, in a sense, the family is counterintuitively very unified because they live in fear. And this strong male presence is the king in the family around which everything else revolves, and it holds it together. Now, it's very dysfunctional. I'm not saying this is good or desirable, but in a sense, you can actually maintain a family this way much longer than you might if the father was very permissive and the father just let the, the woman do what he wants and the children do whatever they want and everybody's doing whatever they want. And then when you, we have a family like that, oftentimes what might happen is that they just decide to, 
to, to spread apart. The wife will say, well, I don't feel so happy with you anymore. I, I like this other guy more, so I'll just go marry him. I'll get a divorce. And the husband will be just like, okay, yeah, sure. Sure, honey, you can do that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold you back. Go ahead and I'll, I'll give you the divorce and you can go be with that guy. I want you to be happy. I'll find my own new uh, wife for me, you know, who I'll be happy with. And the children, you know, now they're grown up, they can just go off and do whatever they want and we're not going to control them. So in this sense, you know, yeah, you got democracy, but then the family falls apart. You know, one of the reasons conservatives, you know, <laughs> one of the things conservatives say, they say, well, but Leo, you know, a lot of these problems we have is we have the collapse of the of the old fashioned family. It's collapsed. Yeah, it's collapsed precisely because that's what happens under democratization. The old fashioned family was often ruled by some asshole father who was very domineering. And now as women have come to parity with men in terms of their economic and political power, now all of a sudden, of course, yeah, women have more more freedom. And so when a woman isn't satisfied in a relationship before, she had to endure it. She had no other option. Now she gets a divorce. She can go do whatever she wants. And this dynamic is still playing out, for example, in the Middle East. In the Middle East, in certain countries, you know, women are, are so suppressed and so dominated that they don't really have the luxury of getting a divorce, for example. Like in Saudi Arabia, it won't be allowed or only under some certain extreme circumstances, which are very favorable to the man, not to the woman. So in a certain sense, this, this makes it easier for people in the Middle East to maintain their classical, traditional, conservative values and families. And there are certain positives to that. Children might benefit from that to some degree, of course. It can also be very dysfunctional. Um, but that's one of the problems I want you to, to notice with democratization is that it, it leads to fragmentation. So with the rise of social media, traditional media now is getting subverted and undermined. And this is one of the things that I'm seeing, which is concerning to me, is that people now have way more autonomy and control over their own epistemology which means their own knowledge base, their own worldview. See, as we democratize, we give more power to everybody in different fields. You have more power with your sexuality. You're, you're more powerful with regards to where you can travel in the world. You're more powerful economically. You're more powerful because you have more technology. You're more powerful because um, you have more you know, career opportunities and so forth. You have more freedom. But as you give people more freedom, it takes a lot of responsibility now. Now something that was done for you by some authority figure, now you have to do it yourself. And if you don't do it properly, you fuck it up. So in the past, epistemology wasn't even a word that people understood. Your worldview was handed down to you by your church and your culture. There was no thing like where you're like, okay, well, should I be a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew or a Hindu? Or should I be a Buddhist or should I be an atheist or a theist? Or should I be a solipsist or should I be a nihilist or should I be a Nietzschean or should I be a conservative or a liberal? You didn't have these choices. And of course, a lot of people still don't have those choices today, but you have more of a choice today than you ever did before in the past. So in the past, you know, you were you were born into a Buddhist family. You were a Buddhist. That's all you knew. That's that's it. You didn't even question it. In a sense, that's easy. It's easy to live life that way, where you're only given one opportunity, one possibility. It's almost like an arranged marriage. See, arranged marriage is also counterintuitive because you would think like, well, if if my parents just, you know, like arranged a marriage for me, that would be so terrible. I don't even know how I would live with that person. We would probably fight all the time. We would not get along. We would be so incompatible because I got to choose the most compatible person for me, right? That's kind of how we think in the West. But actually counterintuitively, like in India, where they do arranged marriages a lot, uh, it almost works the opposite. Because if you do submit to the authority of your parents to pick your mate for you, that's actually a huge relief. Think about it. You don't have to go dating anymore. You don't have to have all the stress of 
thinking about, am I going to die alone? Is that person going to like me? Uh, you know, oh, what if I get this person, but then I like that other person more? There's all this complicated, all these complicated choices, and we sort of hang ourselves with all this freedom. Whereas if your parents, just like when you were born, if your parents said, oh, you're marrying person X, we already have it set in stone, you're just going to marry that person. If you resign to it and you say, okay, fine, I guess I have to because there's no alternative, and you do it, in a sense, you're so all in on that bet with no alternative, you actually make it work. You actually are so committed, you have that, that necessary commitment that is needed to actually go through the arguments and the challenges and actually learn to love that person in a more unconditional way because you had to. Whereas if, if, you, if you just you know, have sex with the hottest person you see, in a certain sense, that's a very shallow reason for, for dating somebody is you know, based on their physical appearance. And then you, you quickly find somebody else that you like more because they're more attractive or whatever. Um, but in an arranged marriage, you don't have that freedom. And in a sense, that actually helps you to maintain a cohesive marriage. Now, of course, it comes with a lot of downsides as well. Um, those are pretty obvious. I won't even mention those. But anyways, my point with this arranged marriage thing is that, so going back to this epistemology business, you see now you have a lot more responsibility over how you adopt, what, what worldview you're going to adopt. There's more worldviews than ever. Which one is right? Which one is healthy? Which one is conducive to democracy? There's a lot of traps now with epistemology. Because see, the problem is that most people don't even know what the word epistemology means. They have no appreciation of it. They have no appreciation of the dangers of epistemology and belief systems and worldviews and ideologies and paradigm locks and all this stuff we've talked about in the past. They have no idea how any of this stuff works. So what they do is they just go online and they just start watching some YouTube channel or some podcast and it could be Alex Jones or it could be some you know conservative person or some liberal person and they just get sucked into it, whatever it is. They're not consciously choosing the information that they're watching. They're unconsciously just consuming information. And places like Facebook and YouTube make it very easy to unconsciously just consume information, go down some particular ideological rabbit hole, and then get stuck in it. See? And so you might say, but, but that's, the, that's freedom, that's great. That is great, except here's the problem. In the past, the primary worldview that you were programmed with from your, from your culture, from your monoculture. Yes, it was very narrow and limited, but it was also, in a certain sense, it was time-tested and it was effective because it survived many generations of trial and error and, um, and you know, survival challenges. It had to survive all that, otherwise it would die out. So in a sense, only the best worldviews, the most effective, I should say, worldviews were able to survive. Um, and they, they weren't too extreme either. For example, a worldview like the KKK, it couldn't have been the, the mainstream worldview because it was too extreme. Certain worldviews are so extreme, they have to, they have to be niche in order to survive. They can't survive at mass scale. So even though, you know, atheists love to criticize, for example, the evils of religion and things like Islam or Christianity and how stupid and how ignorant they are and how much evil has this has caused, actually, we can flip this on its head. In a certain sense, these major worldviews like Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, and so forth, these were the most moderate and sensible worldviews. What you shouldn't take for granted is how many other extreme worldviews existed, which were way worse than these major worldviews. They were so bad, so extreme, so toxic, that you probably even haven't heard of them because they never became mainstream, because they died out long ago, or simply because they, 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 they still exist, but they exist in a very um, specialized, uh, narrow way.
and they can never fully go mainstream. So for example, the KKK can never go fully mainstream, even though it still exists. But you see, the danger now is that now that you have access to, to all the media you want, now that it's been democratized, but you're still a child epistemologically. You just go around, stumble into various conspiracy theories, and now you can really get trapped into some cult, into some radical ideology, which you might think that, oh, well, but, but it's better than the mainstream. It's better than all those elites that were controlling me, but actually it's worse. Just because something is different than the status quo does not automatically make it better. Don't make that mistake. I see a lot of naive people these days who are getting into politics, who are starting to follow some of these populist channels on the left or the right, which are now demonizing CNN and MSNBC and are demonizing the elite media and the New York Times and all this sort of stuff. And they think that they're, just, they're so much better, but actually they're not better. They're even stupider. You have to be very careful about whether your critiques of a system are from above or from below. A lot of these critiques are actually from below. Before you go criticizing a system, understand why it exists in the first place. See, it's very easy for some ignorant, naive person to sit back and criticize the politicians, the Democrats, the Republicans, the Clintons, the Bill Gateses, the this and that. Yeah, it's easy to sit there to criticize all this. You can criticize Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and all this. But the, but the reality is, if I had to bet money on who would actually be able to make a more stable, successful society, I would bet on all those people over you. Over some fucking YouTuber who sits there and rants and complains and criticizes all day, but doesn't know how to achieve jack shit. It's very easy and tempting to sit and to criticize. It's a lot harder when you actually go and try to lead others in a conscious manner towards something better than what already exists. And this is now starting to get ironic because usually I'm very critical of Jordan Peterson and his whole ideology. But I think the part of his ideology, which I totally understand, and uh, now I'm to some extent agreeing with, is that he, he has sort of made this point about how young liberals and progressives on university campuses, you know, they get so idealistic, they try to, you know, go and, you know, involve themselves in politics, but they're young, they're like 22 years old or something. And they think that they've got reality figured out, they have politics and government figured out, and then they go and they start, you know, protesting and getting politically active. Uh, and then, you know, this is where his advice comes in of like, clean your own room. Fix yourself first before you go off and try to fix the world. Because it's very easy to sort of start to fall into this trap of thinking that, oh, you know how to fix the world, how everything should be, but in fact, you've accomplished nothing in your own life. You've not started a successful business. You've not awoken yourself. You've not any, done any deep inner development. You've, you have no you know, serious relationships or understanding of how they work, and yet you think that you can go figure out politics. In this sense, he's right. Now, of course, the problem is that <laughs> as bad as this might be on college campuses, this is even worse with young conservatives. This is not a liberal exclusive problem. This problem exists with young conservatives as well. Libertarians, you know, they have, they have no idea how, how government works and why government exists and why some of the things that exist need to be there. See, government is a very tricky thing because we can have ideas about how government should be, about how society should be, but society and government is such a complex fucking thing that all of our idealistic utopian ideas about it just completely wither and crumble away when faced with the brutality of real life. You might have ideas like, oh, well, police shouldn't shoot black people, and you know, we should be nicer to gay people, and we should be nicer to women, and we should be doing this, and we should be doing that. You have all these 
ideas, but then reality hits you in the fucking face. And then you start to cry and you run away. And all of your fancy ideas crumble. Now, that's not to say that, that you know, fighting for equality is bad. Of course, we should generally fight for equality. But um, you have to be very careful about just forming opinions about politics and government without actually being involved with it and seeing how it really works. Politics is notoriously dirty precisely because it's so brutally utilitarian. And it's so harsh. You, you, you might have some ideas about, oh yeah, Bernie Sanders should be leading everybody. He should win. And if Bernie Sanders didn't win, then fuck Joe Biden. I'm not going to vote for him. He's some corporatist shill. I'm just going to vote third party. Sort of this sort of mentality. It's this very naive, simplistic, utopian uh, perspective on politics. The reality is that Bernie didn't win because Bernie is too radically liberal for the majority of the citizens of America. That's why Bernie didn't win. Not because he was robbed or because some, you know, some elitists, some elitist, you know, Hillary Clinton shills that they somehow, you know, stole it from Bernie. No, 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 no. <laughs> Most of the population is, develop is not developed enough to appreciate what someone like Bernie offers. So the problem we have now is we have more democratization than ever. But this power and freedom and autonomy is being distributed to, to morons who are uneducated about history, government, politics, science, epistemology, personal development, spirituality, survival. And they're just stumbling into the most obvious traps. And they're developing new worldviews that are actually more toxic and less functional than the old ones that they are fighting against. You have to be very careful that the new thing you create is actually going to be better and more democratic in practice than the old system you're replacing it with. And the trick with politics and policy is that oftentimes you come up with some idea about how to change a system and actually it makes it worse. It doesn't make it better. These systems are so complex that no one individual ever sat down and just while sitting in his armchair in his loft, you know, came up with the ideal economic system or the ideal voting system or the ideal constitution. Like it, it didn't work this way. When you do that, you end up in disaster, utopian disaster. What actually happened was that a bunch of different ideas, there was sort of a marketplace of ideas, as they say, um, a bunch of different ideas for different political systems and economic systems. They all were, you know, shared by many people. And then there was a battle for which of these ideas is the best one. And then the ones that were the most survivable and realistic. Those are the ones that actually persevere and all the other ones, they died off or they got marginalized. See, and this happened through a sort of a natural evolutionary process. In a sense, evolution is more intelligent than any one individual human being. And so that's sort of what's happening now with our political process. Now, to start to link this to the present moment and to start to wrap this up, I guess what I want you to see is I want you to see how many of the challenges that we're facing today, whether economically, in the media, culturally, uh, with racism and other issues, how this is related to what is actually a positive force of democratization. And in a sense, this is a consequence of that. And in a sense, what's necessary is for us to 
educate ourselves more to become more conscious as citizens, to understand more deeply the dynamics of these systems that are going on so that then we can be more responsible voters and more responsible citizens, so that we can take ownership and responsibility for our epistemology, our worldview, so that we don't get tracked into various toxic ideologies, conspiratorial thinking, and other things like this, which will um, make things worse, not better. And you can see now why there's a sort of an oscillating up and down feature to this curve of mankind's development. As we get more power, that calls on us to be more responsible, to be more conscious, more loving, more developed. But we're not there yet, and so because we're not there yet, we, we misuse that power, and then that power, that misuse of power that we're given, that misuse of responsibility, down, that pulls us down. See? For example, mankind develops nuclear weapons, and in a sense, that's, that's amazing. You know, we have nuclear technology now, we can have nuclear power plants, awesome, right? If an asteroid is coming to hit the, the Earth, we can even send nuclear weapons at it and blow it up, in theory, Armageddon style. Uh, maybe that would save the Earth. That's a positive thing. That's a positive trend. We're becoming more powerful with atomic knowledge. See, it wasn't just the invention of nuclear weapons. You have to think of it more broadly as that the nuclear weapon is actually a consequence of the fact that we gained atomic understanding understanding of quantum mechanics, basically. That's a powerful thing. We've used that understanding of quantum mechanics not just to build nuclear weapons, but to, to build GPS systems and to build rockets to the moon and to build computers and the internet and all this. Couldn't have happened without an understanding of you know, fundamental principles that ultimately led to the nuclear bomb. So we get this, this massive boost in our power, but then we don't have the responsibility yet to use this power in a conscious, loving manner. And so therefore we go and start throwing bombs at various places and then, you know, potentially cause a nuclear war. And so that, that, that dips us down. But then as we get dipped down, of course, we start to see that we're, we're, we're going to annihilate ourselves or something bad is going to happen. And then that is what triggers us to say, wait a minute, we got to, what's happening here? How do we fix this? Let's, let's pull the plane back up before it crashes. And uh, the way we do that is by taking more ownership and more responsibility, becoming more conscious, more educated, and more, more loving. And then we, we rise back up to even, even higher level than we began, than when the dip began. But then, you know, we, that leads us to even more technology and more power. And then more power and more power, more democratization, more equality. And as all this is happening, consciousness is just kind of doing this snaking dance up and down. So you might wonder, how did Trump come to power? Well, in a sense, Trump came to power because we actually had massive democratization. We had so much democratization that people started to say, hey, wait a minute, I don't like the status quo anymore. Let's get somebody who's outside, a complete outsider. Somebody who's not a traditional politician. Fuck those politicians. They've been so corrupt for for centuries, let's get somebody who's a businessman. Let's get somebody who's who's not from Washington. Let's get somebody with without government experience. That, that government experience is all corrupt bullshit. We don't need someone like Hillary Clinton who has a bunch of government experience. We need somebody fresh, somebody new who can come in there, somebody bold who will, you know, kick some ass and and uh, and not be bashful about it. And who's not going to be the sort of typical polite politician who says the the cordial things who's not going to follow decorum, somebody who's a little bit brash, somebody who's a little bit more normal like us. And then what you get is you get idiots electing somebody who's like them, an idiot. Idiots vote for idiots. And that's how you get Trump. And now you say, well, but, but Trump is a sort of a quasi-authoritarian fascist. And so Leo what you're saying here, it's not true because Trump is a fascist and the world is becoming more authoritarian. There are authoritarians on the rise in, in Eastern Europe, in South America, in, in, in Asia and other places. 
But that's precisely a consequence of the democratization, you see. It's a temporary, temporary dip. You have to see that. It's temporary. It's actually part. The dips are part of the trajectory of going up. You can't go up without having dips. This sort of idea that just because something is different, it's better. And it's going to solve the problem. This is, this is a perfect example of this sort of fallacy is exactly what happened with Trump. See, a lot of people who voted for Trump thought that Trump would, um, would change Washington because he's not from Washington. And this idea that government experience is actually a negative. This is actually one of these examples of thinking that you're more clever than the ones you're trying to replace when actually you're dumber than them. As it turns out, having government experience is extremely important. You can't just get some business buffoon to come out, to come in from the outside and to be able to run an effective government. Even those things that the conservatives wanted from Trump, they can't really get from Trump because Trump is so fucking incompetent at managing things and understanding how government works. We see that with the recent Supreme Court decision on DACA. The only reason that didn't go through is because Trump was so fucking incompetent and his administration was so incompetent with their racist policies that they were so, ra so blatantly racist with their immigration policy that it's even a conservative Supreme Court couldn't rubber stamp it because they would feel like, um, like devils for doing so. So experience does matter. Notice that it's much harder to build something better than it is to tear something down or to criticize something that already exists. Every idiot can criticize an already existing system, but it takes a visionary genius leader to be able to build one that's better. That's far harder. So you see, in a sense, what's happening is that, this is also something I forgot to mention, is that as American society becomes more democratic, also, notice what happens. It becomes more vulgar. Vulgar is an interesting word. Look up the, de the definition of vulgar in the dictionary. Uh, what I mean by vulgar here is that like in the 1950s and 60s in American culture, there was more propriety simply because the culture demanded it of you. You couldn't go around just spouting the F word on TV. You couldn't even say words like bullshit on TV. You couldn't show certain sexual images because they were seen as too immodest. In a sense, this is sort of an old timey cultural relic. We might think, like, oh, immodest or uh, crude or vulgar or obscene, these sorts of notions. These notions have, have significantly been eroded in the last 60 or 70 years of American culture. Nowadays, even on CNN, like I turn on Anderson Cooper sometimes, I, I, I hear him saying bullshit. I hear news anchors saying the F word sometimes. Uh, our culture has become a lot more vulgarized. And the reason is, is because as the cultural power gets more democratized, what happens is that it goes to, it goes from the aristocrats and the elites who have been well-educated, mannered. They were taught manners and ethics and such things at universities, you know, or in religious schools. 
because universities used to be religious schools, basically. All of them were. Um, and so there was a sort of a high, a high bar, a high kind of bar of decency in order to go to a university that you must meet, certain ways you must act and behave. But now that the power is getting spread to ordinary people who most of them haven't gone to university, haven't been educated, uh, you know, they have a more vulgar language, uh, a more vulgar style. And you see that vulgarity spilling out now into YouTube, into Facebook, all over the internet, podcasts, blogs. But now even it's even infecting mainstream media, this vulgarity. Because now, of course, the mainstream media now has to appeal to, to these people and has to compete with, with uh, platforms like YouTube and Facebook where the vulgarity is off the charts. And of course, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm not some vulgarian. Of course, I'm a vulgarian. So I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say that I'm above this. I'm, I'm completely in it. Um, I'm just, I'm just pointing these things out to you just so you, you notice what's happening. And in a sense, there's something, there's something nice about the vulgarity, but there's also something bad about it too. What's nice about it is that it, it feels like media is becoming more real. Like you, one of the biggest differences between watching cable news show and watching a YouTube video is that on a YouTube video, you get sort of like real people talking to you the way that people really talk to you. Like the way you would sit down with a friend and talk about politics, you can get that on YouTube. Or that, the way that maybe some teacher, um, for example, in the way that I communicate with you, I communicate in a sort of vulgar, very common, simple style. I mean, I talk about very advanced metaphysical topics, but I do it in such a... Um, how would I characterize it? It's almost like designed for high schoolers. Right? Like I use very simple language. Um, I talk to you the way that a normal person might talk to you. Whereas when you go on CNN or some, you know, some really polished source like that, which you might say an elitist source, it's, it's got super high production values. It's all, everybody's buttoned down wearing a tie and all this, and they speak very proper and, you know, everything is very produced and managed and, and all this sorts of stuff. And in a sense, it's unreal. It's fake. People don't behave that way. They don't talk that way to each other in real life. So in a sense, it's nice to get that realism from YouTube or from Facebook or whatever. But in another sense, yes, it's kind of more real. But also in a sense, it's a lot more vulgar and um, something is lost in that. Something positive is lost in that. And so what, we, what we're seeing now is, is we're seeing both sides of the aisle, sort of the conservatives and the liberals, they don't respect one another anymore. In the past, there was more respect. People wouldn't just like call each other the F word and so forth to their faces. Whereas now it's, that's a lot more prevalent. And so there's just like more polarization going on. That's just a microcosm of the larger dynamic, the macrocosmic dynamic of the unification and, and the di di division that reality is going through, right? Unification, division like this. Reality is always doing this at all scales and all levels. So right now in America and maybe around the world, we're sort of going through a phase of fragmentation, polarization, diversification. That's going to be happening, I don't know for how long, maybe for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. And then it's going to sort of reach its, its climax. It's going to reach its peak. Probably some bad shit will happen as a result. And then there will be a correction. The pendulum will swing the other way towards unification. And then we're going to slowly start to come back together, unify at a higher level. And each time this unification happens, it's not the same reun reunification happening over and over again. It's a new higher order of reunification. And then again, once that unification happens, again, it'll sort of hit its minimum and then it'll, or maximum, whatever you want to call it, and then it'll start fragmenting again. And again, that won't be the same fragmentation all over again. It'll be a new order of fragmentation, a higher one, leading to a higher reunification after that. 
So overall, I'm very positive about the direction of mankind. I don't buy into any of these apocalypse theories about how mankind is going to end, the environment is going to kill us all, uh, nuclear weapons will kill us all, all of this stuff. I don't buy any of this shit because mankind has been dealing with very serious, bloody problems, life and death problems, from the very beginning. For tens of thousands of years, we've been dealing with these problems, and even for longer. Um, but at least in, in sort of recent recorded history, we've been dealing it, with it for all of recorded history for thousands of years. We've faced much worse problems. We've faced plagues, and we've faced world wars, and we've faced um, terrible atrocities and racism and other things like slavery, which, if you think about it, it's amazing that we were able to abolish it at all. It's amazing we were able to overcome many of these problems that we have. So, based on our track record, I would say we're also capable of overcoming all of our future problems. Whatever racism remains, we can fix it. Um, will people still get hurt and die from it? Of course, in the meantime, yes. But you have to understand that we're talking about this very grand scale, or we're talking about the deaths of millions and billions of people here. So, you know, a couple of people here and there is, you know, a rounding error in the grand scheme of things. Not to say that you should be callous and not care about an individual person's life. You should. It's important not to just turn people's lives into, into mere statistics and rounding errors. But, uh, but also it's important not to get overly outraged over one or two deaths. Because that can turn into a, into a distraction from the real issue, can turn into a red herring. See? And we see this with some of the riots, some of the looting that's been going on. Um, some of, of course, some of these protests are very justified and healthy and, and all good, but also um, it gets out of hand as well. And we already know, if you study Sprout Dynamics Stage Green, go check out my episode, Sprout Dynamics Stage Green. If you study that, you already know. I, I talk in that episode about the excesses of Stage Green. We already know what that is, a sort of a mob mentality, an indecisiveness, a flat hierarchy structure. We know the limitations of Green. Does that mean we don't go green? No, we go green. Right now, what I'm seeing is America is experiencing a green awakening. That's really what's happening. We're transitioning from orange into green. That transition is by no means complete. It will probably continue for another 30 or 50 years to fully complete itself. There's a lot of resistance. A third of Americans want to take us back to blue still. They're completely in denial about green. But nevertheless, they're going to lose. They're on the wrong side of history. Blue is not going to be where America goes in the next 50 years. It will be green. Now, one of the mistakes I see people making here is that they see the excesses of green and they start to use that as an excuse to stay at orange. This is not going to work and this is counterproductive. Yes, there are excesses to green, just as there are to orange and blue and every other stage. But what's really needed now is for us to fully move into green. Of course, just saying that's not going to make it happen. The only way we get to green is by slamming our face in the brick wall of orange, the excesses of orange. See, right now, more and more people are starting to wake up to the excess of orange. The gross income inequality, the shenanigans on Wall Street, the sort of private... Uh, uh, looting and hoarding that is happening amongst the elites in Washington and in, on Wall Street and Silicon Valley, this sort of stuff. The, uh, the sort of monopolistic business practices that are happening. Um, the corporatization of politics and government. The corporate lobbying that happens in Washington that is corrupting our democratic system. This, these are all the excesses of orange, which ordinary people are now facing more and more and more and more. And of course, Trump is the ultimate embodiment of that. He's also quite red. It's about the dynamics red, stage red. But, um, but in a sense, Trump is sort of the culmination of stage orange. He's the ultimate
manifestation of the limits of orange, of the orange worldview and value system. And the world is now seeing the ugliness of orange, the ugliness of Trump. And this will then be the thing that leads to the correction that will be necessary in the next four, eight, or whatever, 12 years to start to now put a nail in the coffin of orange. What is necessary is for us to develop a consensus as a society that stage orange is not the end all be all. Libertarianism, um, unchecked, you know, capitalism, unchecked corporate power and corporate success, and, uh, and a constantly increasing stock market, that these are not the true metrics of success. And we as a culture have to come and unify around that idea to form a new sort of cultural norm where we say that society is not about your individual ability to create a business and to earn billions of dollars and to stay independent and free and not pay a dime in taxes and to be a libertarian. That's not what society is here for. Society is here for a much larger purpose. And if that's the best you can do with your life is that, then that's fine, you can still do that, but we're gonna limit you. We're gonna limit the damage and the excess of that on the rest of society. Because in a sense, what's happened also, which is an interesting thing to notice, is that the tyrannical authoritarian power that a single king used to have in a country, what's happened to it is that it has become democratized, but not fully. What's happened is that that, that power both political power and economic power, because the two go hand in hand, has been diversified, not to the entire population, but to a select number of the most successful business people in the country. So in a sense, it's true that people like Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates and others like that, Warren Buffett, they have an enormous, overwhelming amount of political power because of their economic power. And in the future, that's not going to be tenable. What's going to have to happen in the future is that we're going to need to democratize not just the government and voting rights and civil rights. We're going to have to democratize the business sector, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, these giant media platforms. They're going to have to become more democratized because fundamentally it's not right or fair that somebody like a Bill Gates gets to control all the operating systems on the planet, or most of them. Or that someone like Jeff Bezos gets to control and make decisions about every single purchase that's made online, or most of them. Or that somebody like Mark Zuckerberg gets to control and decide how people can connect with friends through the internet. Right? This is fundamentally undemocratic for one person to have that much control and that much power. The only reason they have it is because these are new frontiers of technology that have been developed recently and they have not yet been regulated because we haven't figured out how to best regulate them. There's a lot of criticism of people like Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey from Twitter and so forth because they're not regulating their platforms the way that people want them to regulate it. But this, this problem of regulating and policing platforms is an extremely challenging problem. I don't envy Zuckerberg or Dorsey or, or other people like this. They have an enormous responsibility. And one of their problems is that these people, they're from stage orange mostly, so they came into this endeavor with Twitter and Facebook and so forth and Google you know, and Amazon. They just came into it saying like, well, I'm going to start a website. It's going to become popular and I'm just going to earn a bunch of money from it. That sounds like a good idea. And then they did it and they succeeded. Great. But what they didn't realize is that you didn't just start some website that's earning you a lot of money. You created, the reason your website earns you so much money is that because you created a, a platform which is integral to the functioning of the entire society. Whether it's Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter. The only reason these companies earn as much money as they do Apple as well, with their iTunes and App Store, especially. Uh, the reason that these companies earn so many billions so effortlessly 
every single quarter is because they're so deeply intertwined with the culture and the fabric of society. But it's precisely for that reason that they can't be ruled by one single individual or even a small corporate board because that's fundamentally authoritarian. And so in the future, we're going to see the democratization of these giant companies um, in all these various sectors because people will get more and more frustrated by it because these companies are sucking up more and more resources, increasing the economic inequality in the country and getting too much power for their own good. See, the problem is that you get so much power, you ultimately, it goes full circle. It starts to corrupt you. These companies like Facebook and Google and Apple and Microsoft, they think that they need more money and more success and more power. But actually what happens is that after a certain point, it starts to backfire on them. They're seeing that now. And what I predict will happen in the future is that these, these handful of companies in particular, which are so integral to the functioning of society and the world, not just America, but the entire world, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Apple, and a few others that I'm not mentioning. Uh, these companies are going to be the source of a lot of tension going forward in the future because they've monopolized together. These companies have basically monopolized it, uh, probably half of the world economy is owned by these six companies or so, and it's only going to get worse. And right now, all these companies are still new. That means they still have some sense of the original founder's vision. You see, these companies, usually the way that the company goes through a life cycle, the company is usually founded, a successful company is usually founded by some visionary leader. This visionary leader is usually pretty good, pretty benevolent, uh, pretty caring and passionate about the field he's in, which is why he's able to create this company. Sometimes people like to criticize people like Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos. But if you think that's bad, imagine what happens when the, when the life cycle of the company, because right now we're, we're still in this phase of the life cycle of the company, still the beginning chapters. What happens in 50 or 100 years when all of these founders die from old age? Um, and they get replaced by tools and corporate chills and committees and Wall Street types who only care about money. Now you might say, oh, yeah, but that's already the case. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and, and uh, Elon Musk and all these people, all they care about is just money. No, that's not right. The original founders of a company they didn't found the company just for money, even though that's a popular stereotype. They actually founded it because they were passionate about something. The pure money types, the Wall Street wolves, those types, those are who come at the end of the life cycle of the company. Once all the ideas have been exhausted, all the creativity of the company has been exhausted, that's when the wolves come and they try to squeeze every penny out of the company. And they, they bankrupt the company morally. And then usually that moral bankruptcy leads to a financial bankruptcy in the end. And then they're going to pull out all the money before it goes bankrupt. You see, they suck it dry. These Wall Street wolves. Because uh, these are not true visionaries. These are not the founders. So what happens when half of the world's economic power and therefore also political power as well, is put in the hands of these Wall Street wolves who are just going to be thinking about how can I extract as much money for myself and my family as possible and my partners as possible from this company like Google, like Facebook, like Amazon, like Microsoft. What happens then? That's what I foresee as being a huge huge looming problem in the future that nobody is yet talking about. People do not appreciate how much power a company like Google has, or Amazon has, or Facebook, or Apple has. 
It has way more power than we currently appreciate because it has not, we have not really seen any of these companies yet, as much as you might hate these companies or think that they are undermining democracy, you haven't even seen the beginning, the tip of the iceberg. We've only seen the tip of the iceberg of how much damage these companies can do if they really stopped caring and if they really were controlled by people who just didn't give a shit and were willing to do any kind of damage for money. Yeah, but at the same time, even though that makes it sound very negative and pessimistic, here's the silver lining. The silver lining, and here's a thing that nobody will really tell you in the news or on YouTube, in any political analysis, because they don't understand this. this. It takes a deep understanding of human consciousness and collective consciousness to understand this. Corporations are also evolving. Corporations are not a static thing. How many times have you heard that, oh, corporations, they only care about money? That's actually not true. It might seem on the surface that corporations only care about money. That's only because right now, predominantly most of our corporations in the 21st century are at Spiral Dynamics Stage Orange. But as the people in the organization evolve, as the leaders who run the organization evolve up the spiral, so will the corporations. Because highly advanced, loving, conscious, developed, moral leaders are not going to lead organizations that are unconscious, fearful, selfish, depraved, immoral, and so forth. It's not going to happen. So the silver lining is that corporations like Facebook, Amazon, Google, and whatever else, they will also have to evolve. And in fact, they are in the process of evolving. This is exactly what we're seeing with Google and Amazon and, and Facebook. We're seeing these companies evolve. You're seeing their employees staging protests, which is forcing the management of these companies to respond. Many of these Silicon Valley companies are already halfway stage green, at least culturally, if not economically. Companies like Google are some of the most advanced, high consciousness companies that exist compared to oil companies and others, military companies and others. Some of these companies like Google, for example, they have fairly high ethics. Now you might have certain things you can nitpick about Google. You might say, oh, they don't treat this person right. They don't treat that person issue or this issue right, whatever. But overall, these Silicon Valley companies, you have to appreciate, they're actually better than the majority of companies. You should actually be grateful that internet companies are roughly spiral dynamic stage orange slash green in their culture rather than pure orange or blue slash orange, which many companies are. For example, many Wall Street companies are just pure orange. Google is not like that. If it was, Google would be a lot more evil than it is. Now, that doesn't mean Google is not evil at all. Um, every company, every organization is selfish, like every individual is selfish. It's a matter of striking that balancing act, see? But what I'm saying in a nutshell is that these companies will also have to evolve into pure green and then above that, and this will soften them, make them more compassionate, more loving, more democratic. And so in this sense, I'm... I'm an eternal optimist. I'm an optimist in the long view. I think mankind is going to be able to deal with all of its problems. I think we can deal with all of our war problems, our famine problems. We can deal with all the environmental, ecological problems. We can do it. And in fact, I think we're too fucking selfish to do anything else. Because in the end, it's our selfishness which will keep us from destroying ourselves. Because we're just too selfish to kill ourselves. See, now, will a lot of people get hurt in the process? Of course they will. They always have. That's always been the case. There will always be casualties and collateral damage and innocent people getting run over by this machine that humanity is. Uh, but then again, do you have a better idea? See, it's easy to sit there and to criticize about how awful humanity is, but... What else, what other game is in town? You got a better way of, of, of managing 7 billion people?
even though right now we live in the Dark Ages, this era will be known as the Dark Ages by future generations. Hundreds of years from now. Um, we are in the Dark Ages scientifically, spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, politically. So even though we are in the Dark Ages, I'm still very optimistic. Because we have, from the darkness, the only, the only, the only other alternative to, to darkness is light. You see? And we are right at that point now that we have, we have the knowledge and the understanding. That's the crucial thing. We have the understanding to really... Um, get our shit together by which i mean we have the spiritual understanding we have the psychological understanding we have the metaphysical and existential understanding that is necessary to understand what drives all of mankind and what unifies all of mankind which is the desire for love and consciousness now it's just a matter of how long is it going to take to to spread all this information, the high quality information out to the masses. Because right now, there's a lot of high quality sources happening on YouTube, but there's a lot, also a lot of low quality sources, creating a lot of noise and turmoil, and people are not able to differentiate between what's the good stuff, what's the bad stuff, what should be trusted, what shouldn't be trusted. This process has to play itself out. Uh, it's going to probably take us another 50 years to really resolve all this, and to start to upgrade our education system to start teaching this this new material the material that i talk about so much on this channel this has to get spread out through official channels like the education system into the mainstream media and elsewhere that will take time to happen and there will be a lot of resistance to it and there will be a lot of noise in the meantime a lot of conspiracy theories and distractions and red herrings and so forth and traps so you as an individual don't get trapped by that, but also don't be surprised that a lot of your friends and colleagues will fall into it. We should expect that. It's uh, it's all part of this democratization process. See, once we really upgrade our education system and we start teaching these fundamental spiritual, metaphysical, conscious concepts to people early on and get them not just to learn it as a dogma, but to actually experience it, to feel it, uh, to start to understand things like spiral dynamics and so forth at an early age. Um, that is going to create sort of a new metaculture that's going to link us together. What we're really missing now is some sort of vision for what America could be if we work hard together over the next 50 years. That's what's really missing. I don't see any politician really articulating that vision. There's so much we can do as Americans, if we get our shit together, if we come together and we really want to grow and we start to educate ourselves and we start to take seriously the idea of lifting everybody up, helping everybody raise their consciousness. In the meantime, as we're doing that, we're also spreading opportunity across laterally to all the marginalized groups. Um, and if we act fearlessly, America could set the next prototype for what all the other nations in the world could be moving us into spiral dynamics tier two level of governance with all the intellectual power and economic power that we have and all the cultural power that we wield still through hollywood and through the media because the whole world is basically watching us and following us culturally so in a sense we're, we're doing a great disservice to other nations other nations are starting to out pace America in certain ways because we're so fragmented and so polarized we're just kind of running around with our heads cut off like a chicken with no sense of direction but also I understand this is, this is totally necessary this is a necessary phase for America to go through before we find a new sense of direction and vision 
And there's a lot of resistance. So a lot of what you're seeing, a lot of the turmoil you're seeing, a lot of the confusion and noise in the media and elsewhere that you're seeing, violence and so forth, a lot of it is coming from people who are being left out from the prosperity and from the development. You see, what's not going to work is it's not going to work to take half the country and to lift up half the country, but the other half stays where they are. That can't work. So the part that wants to rise up needs to figure out a plan to help elevate those parts that are struggling to rise up. That's part of the challenge. We can't just, as, as progressives, we can't just look at, at, at conservatives and, and just call them idiots and morons and, uh, and just kind of like leave it at that. That's not going to resolve the problem. We need to figure out a way how to get them to see what we see, to buy into our vision, to help them along economically, culturally, whatever, to understand their point of view. And of course, many of them will resist. And the reason that happens is that at, at any given point in time, you take a society, you can take that society, you can cut it in half. Half of that society will be progressive. Half that society will be conservative, roughly speaking. Half of that society will be on the upper end of the spiral. Half that society will be on the lower end of the spiral. And of course, uh, the lower end of the spiral is going to resist moving up to the higher end of the spiral. The higher end of the spiral, half, is going to look down at the at the lower half and is going to like uh, do a face palm, wondering how how ignorant and stupid they are. But at the same time, it's the higher half's responsibility to find a way to elevate the lower half. Because the higher half is more conscious and more loving by definition. This is higher. And therefore, it's more capable of doing that. And in the end, how do you elevate the, the lower half? Consciousness, love, understanding. Fundamentally, those are the principles. And then, of course, how that actually gets manifested and fleshed out in practice, that, that can all, that the devil of all that is in the details. See, the more conscious and loving you become, the less interest you have in controlling others. The less interest you have in power. And so naturally, you want democracy because you want everybody to experience life at your level. And life at your level of high consciousness and high development is you take a lot of responsibility and ownership for your creation of reality. You are the creator of your reality. And of course, by being the creator, you, you take on the responsibility and the autonomy. You create consciously. And then you can be entrusted with more power without worry that you're going to abuse it or get corrupted by it. And that's sort of what all of, all of life is leading towards, is becoming more powerful as a creator, more conscious, more loving. All these go hand in hand, more selfless. Fundamentally, the reason our society is so fucked up and has been for thousands of years and will be for probably hundreds more is because we're too selfish. Too many of us are too selfish. Not the elites are too selfish, but ordinary average people are too selfish. And nothing is going to fundamentally change until you become less selfish. That is true both individually for your own life and for the collectives that you're a part of, whether it's your family, your business, your town, or your country, or your species, your planet. So hopefully this interconnects a lot of stuff for you, makes a little bit more sense of what's going on in the world. Remember to keep your eye on the ball, 
develop yourself. You can still partake in collective issues. So I'm not, I'm not doing the sort of Jordan Peterson nonsense of telling you that, oh, clean your room and that's it, mister. It's like, no, no, no. Yes, clean your fucking room, of course. But also have an eye out for understanding how collective systems work and educate yourself about it. Contemplate about it. Don't just adopt some ideology from some person on YouTube about it. Really get curious, start to study these systems. And then play, play, start to play some leadership role in changing these systems. Take some responsibility and ownership over them. Don't just sit and whine or start some YouTube channel about bitching and moaning about the politicians, but actually try to go out there and construct something, do something constructive. You see, criticism isn't really constructive. Go build something that's actually more conscious and more effective as a system for your collective. Contribute to your collective in whatever way is appropriate to you. Maybe that means running as a volunteer for some politician or even running as a politician for some new position. Maybe it's that or maybe it's something less direct. It doesn't have to be that direct. Maybe it's about becoming a coach or a teacher or a shaman or whatever and having your impact that way on the collective. So as you're going forward in your life, really there's two fundamental facets to your development that are related and both very important. Your individual growth and then how that connects with and intersects with your contribution to the collective that you're a part of. So keep those both in mind. See, it's natural that as you become more conscious and developed, you're going to want to take more responsibility for the collective that you're a part of. And you can get a lot of meaning and value um, and satisfaction from having an effect using your personal growth to then affect others in positive ways, whatever those are, whether it's through business or through spirituality or through politics or government or environmentalism or art or whatever that is. So even though there's a lot of bullshit that comes with being a social species, there's also a lot of positive as well. The positive is the opportunity that it gives you to impact others, which you couldn't otherwise do if you were just living alone by yourself in the woods somewhere. So you have that opportunity, start thinking about how to best leverage this opportunity. Really, it can be a win-win situation where you grow yourself into this powerful conscious leader and then you lead others with that and you help inspire others to be conscious leaders. You empower them and that synergizes and the two work hand in hand. And that's how we create more democracy and that's how we create a better society. That's how we elevate the consciousness and love of the entire planet. And since that's really the only game in town, what else are you going to do? You only have two options here. You're either going to do this or you're not. If you do it, you can either do it consciously or unconsciously. If you do it unconsciously, you won't be effective at it. If you do it consciously, you can be very effective at it. If you don't do it, if you choose to just kind of be selfish and hang out and kind of live an irresponsible life where you don't really contribute to your collective in a positive, meaningful way, if you do that, or if you resist it, um, you're going to be on the wrong side of history. The human species will become more conscious and more loving and more egalitarian and more democratic and higher up the spiral, whether you like it or not, whether you become a Nazi or not, whether you join the KK or not, whether you become a conspiracy theorist or not, whether you blow up some, some, civilian building or not, whether you shoot up a school or not. So why not um, just like side yourself with the inevitable forces of consciousness and love rather than fear and depression and selfishness and misery. 
side yourself with God, in other words, and then um, turn yourself into a vehicle towards this evolution. And then you will reap the rewards that naturally come with that. And if you don't, if you act lazy and depressed and bitch and moan and complain and act like a victim, then, um, or you act out of fear and so forth with your conspiracy theories, and you criticize and you act toxic and polarized, if you do that, then um, you're also going to suffer the consequences, the karma that comes with that, the karma of selfishness. So make a conscious choice, start working on that, and uh, you should notice that you start to feel better about your life, and you start to feel better about mankind. There's a lot of distraction happening these days in the news, and it, it's very easy to get sidetracked by and get all pessimistic about it, because the news shows you all sorts of negative stuff like war and genocide and racism and this sorts of stuff. Uh, it doesn't show you the good stuff. So again, don't get distracted by all the petty human shit that's happening around you. Keep your eye on the ball, on your purpose, on developing yourself, and then having the contribution to mankind and leading others towards consciousness and to love. That's what you've got to do and ignore all the naysayers and all the uh, all the people who are tearing their hair out and whining and complaining and, and worrying and caught in fear. You can't be a powerful creator or leader when you are trapped by fear. Even when it's fear of something like economic, uh, or sorry, uh, environmental collapse, that's still fear-based thinking if you're sitting there worrying about the environment. Which is not to say that the environment doesn't need our attention. It needs massive attention. But that's not solved through fear and through criticism. That's solved through uh, developing yourself and then becoming a vehicle for God to then do God's work on earth and to inspire and uplift others with your creative contributions, positive creative contributions. That's what we need. So get to work. All right, I'm done here. Please click the like button for me and come check out actualize.org. That's my website. You'll find my blog, the Life Purpose Course, the book list, the forum. Uh, you can support me on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash actualize, chip in five bucks a month. That helps to fund my work. Uh, and lastly, what should I say to wrap this up? Hmm. Try not to treat politics as some dirty thing that you are above. I notice that people who treat politics this way, they actually contribute to its dirtiness. There's something very, very profound going on within politics that people are not aware of. There's something profound going on in society with how our government is organizing itself that people are not aware of. Society is organizing itself to higher and higher complexity, systemic complexity. And you can play a role in that. You can shape that. You can start by trying to understand how it works. And you can actually start to appreciate how politics is love. See, usually you tell a person, oh, politics is love. Like, well, what kind of hippie bullshit is that? Of course it's not. But what's really, really profound, and the point that I want to ultimately guide you to is to the point where in your life you will be able to understand how politics is love. Even the most dirtiest kinds of politics is love. But of course, that will take a lot of development from you, a lot of awakening a lot of contemplation, a lot of open-mindedness, a lot of surrendering of your judgments and criticisms and political positions. So whatever political positions you have, 
I recommend that you throw them away and start from scratch. Start to look at government in a non-ideological way. Start to see the spiritual aspects of it that are there. It's not there because some evil people want to control the world. It's much more subtle and complex than that. It's much more benevolent than that. But that's a topic for another time. So stay tuned because, yeah, I probably will have more political topics in the future. We still have yet to talk about economics. I want to have some, some videos about economics. I want to have some videos about libertarianism. I still want to talk about... Um, I'm going to have videos about leadership. There's still some important insights about leadership that I need to communicate to you. We're going to have more videos on spiral dynamics, more videos on developmental psychology, uh, other social endeavors like science. That's coming soon. We're going to have a series of videos about how science works and the, the complexity, the social complexities that are involved with science. So yeah, there's... There, there's a lot of material that's sort of at the at the nexus point between the individual spiritual growth and sort of the collective development that we're doing as a as a species. So stay tuned for those.